Joined now by TSN hockey analyst, former Vancouver Canuck, the one and only Frank Corrado. Frankie, how we doing? Good. How you guys doing? Yeah, doing all right. Mm -hmm. Got Jay Pat here. Yeah, there we go. All Mm -hmm. right. Um, We'll start with our Tim Hortons poll question. Team offense, team defense. What is the Vancouver Canucks strength? I think it's offense. I think that like they're a good defensive team. I think a lot of it also stems from Demko being a really good goaltender. But when push comes to shove, I think this team has an extra gear offensively. And when they find that extra gear, I think that's their separator, right? Like they'll they'll hang in there. They'll be a hard team to play against. They'll get the saves from their goaltender. But what really separated them early on in the season, as it was well documented, they were scoring more than they were generating. And that was really propelling them in the standing. So if they can find that again, I think that's their kind of X factor separating thing that uh, should help them in the playoffs. Have you been surprised that Lindholm hasn't been able to generate more offense uh, with the Canucks? Well, I would have said I'm surprised until you hear that he's dealing with some kind of nagging injury. And as a guy who's had a lot of injuries in hockey and tried to play through a lot of stuff, the kind of discourse um, around the way this injury has has evolved would lead me to believe that it's something more substantial than than maybe we we think or we know. And it's it's a tough situation for the player because you feel like, well, obviously you're obligated to play, but you feel like you, you want to prove to this team that just traded for you, you know, good assets that you can help them, you can help them win. And, you know, from an individual point of view, he's also playing for a contract. And, you know, who knows in Calgary what those discussions were like. You would imagine at some point there were numbers thrown around. And if you turn down some some good money in Calgary at some point, you probably look at it and say, man, I'm in a tough spot now because I'm hurt. I'm not producing. This is not not great optically. Um, so to answer your question, I'm I'm surprised in a in a way but when when someone's hurt like that and you know there's you don't know what's going on under the hood then mm-hmm. there's your kind of contributing reason as to why that's probably happening uh as uh my partner here has noted many a time since the end of january this power play of the canucks has been really uneven uh and in fact in a lot of cases disappointing since the all-star break um 10 games left here how important would you think it to be to have the power play going for the playoffs? Because it seems like every time I've talked to hockey players over the years about power play, they go, you know, sometimes it's an odd thing. You have a bad power play. You throw a puck on that. It goes in. Sometimes you do everything right. The goalie gets the save. But where would your concern level be on the power play? And it's clicking going into the playoffs. Fairly concerning. And I look at it this way. Okay, when When you're playing – throughout the course of a regular season, you practice the power play a lot because it's very important and you need to actually physically do it. You need to get the repetitions. You need to execute and practice. That leads to executing in the game. When it comes to the penalty kill, a lot of the guys that play on the penalty kill, they actually are power play guys and they just practice the power play because the penalty kill, you can kind of watch it on the video and understand that if you're in the right spot and you skate hard and you block shots and you compete, that'll that'll turn around for you like that that'll go the way you want it to go with the power play and we've seen a lot of different looks now from this team and that's kind of where i go to say okay you try the different looks they tried the balanced units they've shuffled things around on the first unit now at some point you have to kind of give it your look and say this is what we think is the best unit we've had some success with this And let that go for a little bit, because as much as you want to push buttons and pull players off here and there and try and find lightning in a bottle and see if you get something that clicks, there is something to be said for putting your guys out there, letting them play through it and letting them keep getting those repetitions. Like how many times and it happens every once in a while where a team had just got a power play clicking. Everyone's firing on all cylinders. Power play's doing great. Now it's a 5-1 game or a 6-1 game. You know what the coach says? He goes, I'm sorry that this might be a little embarrassing for you, but I just got my power play going or I need to get my power play going. They're going back on the ice. And so, you know, with that kind of mindset, um, you know, you, you think about where this this unit 
could go. It's got to be the best five players and put them in their spots that you think will work the best or has worked the best in the past and give them some runway here to just let them play through it. Had an early power play against the Kings the other night. Didn't convert. Three games against Los Angeles now this season, Frank, and there's still one more to go in the regular season and possibly a, a playoff opponent uh, as well. So keep that in mind. Uh, but the Canucks haven't had the lead against the Los Angeles Kings, and that is obviously a dangerous way to play against Los Angeles. They get the lead. They dictate the way things go. And we saw them. You lived here in Vancouver. You remember those gray, gloomy days? That's what it felt like for two and a half hours the other night at Rogers Arena watching the Canucks slog against the Kings. Uh, so much made about this 1-3-1. But if you're drawing things up on a chalkboard for the Canucks or for their fans, what do they have to do better to penetrate a very stifling Los Angeles defense? The obvious answer when it comes to the one three one is to transition the puck and move the puck before LA is able to get set up in that. Um, but that's the thing that LA does better than other teams who have used this one three one. They're better at getting set up in it, whereas other teams may have had a little more time and maybe a little more space given to them before they were able to get set up in it. LA, it's like they get in it really quickly. And I think for LA, they live and die by it for me a little bit too much. Like when it's on and it's working, it's obviously very difficult for the other team. When it's not working and they're a little disjointed, I find there's a lot of leaks in it. And we've seen that for with LA a lot this season where they were really struggling because when the one three one isn't working, now all of a sudden they're not a big puck pursuit team. I don't I don't find that they really have this heavy forecheck where they they try and come at you although it was a physical game against Vancouver that was well documented like I really think the the 131 for them can be a crutch at times so the obvious answer is to transition the puck before they're able to get set up in it and once they are set up in it now it's like you really need your skilled players to find ways to weave through it and if you're going to dump the puck in it has to be one of those hard rims that the goalie can't get to or Drew Doughty can't. You can't be a soft chip into the corner because Drew Doughty's back there. He's waiting for it. Now he can make the breakout play. So there, it becomes a, a, a more patient kind of game. Whereas if you're Vancouver, you know, when, when I watch Vancouver play at their best, they're giddy up and go. It's like, let's get after it. Not Not that they're not a thinking team but they'd have to play a little more patient against LA in order to have some success. Personally, when I played, I was never a fan of playing the one, three, one, because I felt like if I was the defenseman who was back, I felt like I was alone. And if that three across the red line ever did get kind of penetrated, I felt like it was two on ones all the time. And so there is, there is some vulnerability there for Vancouver, um, but it is up to them to, to find a way to bring that out in LA. Hey, we saw this in the last game, not, not this past game, but the previous one where, where Quinn Hughes just hung on to the puck in his own zone. Uh, of course, famously 2011, Chris Pronger of the Flyers, as instructed by Peter Laviolette, just sat there in his own zone with the puck and dared Tampa, coached by Guy Boucher, to come forecheck him, which they never did. Why don't defensemen, like, why don't teams just sit there and say, no, we're not going to let you just be passive and hang yeah. on to the puck? You know what? I think you could do it every, like, just, just to prove a point and be like, look how ridiculous this, this, this is. No one <laughs> wants to come for check. Like we're playing hockey here at the end of the day. So I, I think you could do it once and just prove your point. But in the grand context of playing hockey and playing the game, I don't know. Is that helping you in any way? Like, are you going to gain any kind of advantage yeah. by just standing there? It's not like the referee is going to be able to call a delay game on LA. Like you have the puck. The onus is on you to bring it towards mm -hmm. the other team's net. You can't just tell them, Hey, you guys got to chase. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's, it's, it's so one you, of those things. So you think that top forward, the one in the one, three, one will just be totally disciplined and won't ever take the bait if defense I, I think there's a very good chance i think there's okay. a very good chance that, that that because once he moves out of his position now the three like he's the steerer so he needs to steer 
let's say it's Quinn Hughes, to one side of the ice. So now everyone knows what side of the ice that's going on. They try and suffocate it at the red line or force a bad dump in. So without the steerer, now it's just three guys on the blue line not knowing which way things are going to go. There was, there was one thing that really kind of stood out to me last game, and it was Elias Pettersson and Philip Deneau. And there was a time where Pedersen is carrying the puck up the ice and dynamic, shifty, finds a way to, you know, make a little bit of a move. But Phil Deneau is so good at kind of just getting a piece of him, just getting in his way. And we've seen it, you know, I I saw it here in Toronto when Montreal played against uh, Toronto in the playoffs in the bubble. And Deneau was so good against Austin Matthews, like, that's the that's one of the matchups where as much as Pedersen is very good at being shifty and evasive, the one three one matched with a guy like Dano, who really thinks the game in a defensive way and has a little bit of gamesmanship to to his game, that's gonna be a, another challenge for for Vancouver. It's not just the system, it's the personnel right. playing the system. So are the Kings a worse matchup then, Frank, than Vegas in the playoffs for Vancouver? I, I, it depends what kind of Vegas team you're going to get. Like, are you getting the healthy Vegas? And even if you do, like, let's say you do get the fully healthy Vegas, have they had time to really gel as a group? Like, and 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 Vegas is the, the answer is Vegas. The 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 healthy Vegas team is going to be a very very good team, and you don't want to play against them. L. A. Still has you know uh, goaltending that you don't feel the most comfortable with maybe in a seven game series. And if we've seen, you know, anything from LA the last couple of years going against the Edmonton Oilers is that high end skill still can find a way to produce against that team. So they, they don't scare me that much, but you really have to be disciplined in the way you approach the game. And it is a little more of a, a, a thinking kind of game when you play LA, but like for Vancouver, they've, they've kind of earned where they are in the standings all season long with their own play, there really shouldn't be a team that we talk about in the Western conference that we say, yeah, I don't like that team for Vancouver. Like Vancouver, they are where they are for a reason. And they've been very good all season long. Frank, we saw Rick Tockett go to his line blender and kind of hit the turbo button on it in the third period. And, And for a lot of the reasons we just talked about, things weren't happening for them the other night. So I, I get where he was coming from. I just wonder, as a defenseman in your day, were there nights where you would look or be out on the ice and think, like, what is the coach doing here? Or do you have the blinders on and your job is just to to play with whoever's uh, up front and trying to do whatever they can to provide a spark? Uh, So one time in the minors, we had a coach forget about a line for, like, a whole period, basically. Like, we're so we were playing in, in Springfield in the American hockey league and it's weird benches there. So there's a part of the bench where like you're almost out of sight, out of mind. So you almost don't want to sit there. And I guess after the game, the line, like they, they went up to the coach and they're like, what, what the hell happened? Like, why, why didn't we play? Like, I thought we were playing pretty well. He's like, what do you mean? Like, I didn't play you guys. Like, I didn't see them. Like it was crazy. And it was, it was the talk of our dressing room for a little while after that. Um, But you know what? I, I, I was one of those guys, to be honest with you, I kind of struggled with, with confidence and I would get really down on myself. And I found that, you know, if I made a couple mistakes in a game that were a little glaring, I'd almost have this mentality where I'm waiting for the coach to kind of pat me on the back and be like, hey, you're going to sit a shift or you, you know what I mean? Like you kind of, you're aware it could be coming and that's not a good mentality to have. Like it's almost better to just, you don't think about anything. You just keep playing and something happens. It's either someone else's fault or that guy shouldn't have been standing there. Or, you know, I I don't even think about it. Like those kinds of defense mechanisms seem to help players a little more than where I was like super analytical, super critical about my game. And that just led to more thinking and a little more uh, anxiety in my game. But I, I, I never really focused much on the forward lines because you're so focused on what you're doing and what's happening on the back end and who's coming off the ice and who's going next. So, you know, sometimes you'll, you'll see there's a forward line on the ice and you're like, Oh, that's cool. They're playing together. Like, you know, you just, <laughs> sometimes you just don't even realize it when you're playing D. Uh, Philip Pronick anchored his own pair against the Kings with Nikita Zadorov. Um, to, it's late in the day, but uh, the Canucks of course have dueling interests here. Uh, number one, um, they want to see him, 
um, they want to get him resigned and they want to get an idea of his worth. And number two, of course, if they have to uh, split up Hughes and Hronick, they need to see that as well um, prior yeah. to the playoffs. What did you make of it? And, and what do you think of the whole concept of Hronick anchoring his own pair before committing big dollars to him? Well, the, the anchoring the own pair thing is interesting. I Ideally, yes, if you're going to pay a guy that much money, he would have to anchor his own pair. Devon Taves makes seven and a half million dollars. Am I right there? So, somewhere there. He doesn't anchor his own pair, plays with Kale McCarr, seems to work pretty well. So there, there there's some holes in that argument to be had. Um, I just, you know, it would be nice if you had a, a guy making that much money to have him be the, the star piece on a pairing and have someone kind of roll with him. But if something works well within your group, like it does in Colorado, like it does in Vancouver when Hughes and Hironic play together, I'm not overly concerned about it because at the end of the day, it's about what makes your team better. And if it's going to cost you a little bit more to sign Philip Hironic and you really, really believe in it, I think I said this last week or a couple of weeks ago to you guys, it's probably easier to hide an extra million dollars on the back end because at least if you're not going to get, you know, big time point production, you'll get a penalty killer. You get a guy who plays 20 plus minutes. You'll get a guy who can play against teams, top lines. So you'll still kind of find a way to get more value out of that. Whereas if you sign a guy up front for, you know, $5 million and maybe, you know, that was on the open market and, you know, maybe he was probably a three and a half, four $4 million player and he's not giving you that $5 million worth of production. That's more of an anchor for your group because now you're limited in what you're actually getting. So the, the argument for Hironic, like I, I do believe he has a good argument to to make really good money this year. I am still just of the belief when, and, and I'd have to dig more into the comparables on this, whether it's, you know, there's Devon Taves and Morgan Riley, and, you know, you have to take age and um, what sh- what hand they shoot, all those kinds of things into consideration. But when I see those guys in the sevens, I'm like, okay, I understand the cap is going up, but I'd be doing everything I possibly could to get him, you know, in the sevens. Like I, I, I just, I wouldn't want it starting with an eight. That's obviously me speaking. There could be other opinions and I know there is other opinions, but um, I, I don't think it necessarily hinges on has to be able to anchor his own pair. Uh, lastly, you did the uh, Colorado Montreal game. On Tuesday night, Dallas actually leaps into the lead of the Western Conference now with 99 points after their victory. Who do you like to finish first in the West? Ooh, um, I I was really high on Colorado, and they, they were kind of flat last night, although they had a, a, a good start in that game. Dallas is one of those teams that just very quietly goes about their, their business, um, and then Winnipeg's fallen off a little bit recently. It's a it's pretty cool how this year in the West we've got a lot of like good races it seems between Dallas, Colorado, and in Vancouver. I don't see any reason why why Vancouver can't be the first place team in the Western Conference this year. Like even even you know with Casey to Smith and Ned, I think Casey's played pretty well. I think Vancouver's played really well the last little while. Um, there's there's no like I feel like there's no separating factor between Colorado, Dallas, and Vancouver right now to say this team is going to be it. Like, they're very evenly matched, and I think come playoff time, we're going to see that, especially in the first round, just how tight things are in both conferences. And, um, you know, like, Vancouver's been there. They've been there a long time this season. So that's why I would feel confident with the fact that Vancouver has a very good chance at, at finishing first in the West. It's not like this is just a, a hot streak or a flash in the pan. Like they've been there for a long time this season. So it's hard to say because they are so close, but any one of those three teams, I feel like could do it. Great stuff, Frank. Appreciate the time here. We'll catch up next week. All right, boys. Thank you. Hey, everybody, if you're enjoying what you're seeing here, then follow along with Secure Some Price on YouTube. I promise more content coming. They call it, the kids call it subscribe on YouTube. Well, how about liking it? Do that as well. Smash it right now.